conversation in the Onondaga Land Rights in Our Common Future series. Um, I'm honored to introduce our guests. Uh, tonight's talk is on the influence of the Haudenosaunee women, and we've got Jeannie Shenandoah, um, who probably you all know, uh, from the Onondaga Nation, a midwife, an activist, and an environmental organizer. And we have Sally Wagner, a feminist, an educator, a writer, and the director of the Matilda Jocelyn Gage Foundation. And if you've ever had the pleasure to be out at the house in Fayetteville, where the museum is being made, you'll see, really, in a way, um, the theme of tonight, the, inter the intersections of various movements from the 19th century, um, of which these two women so much share the history and the presence of two of them. And that's women's rights, the Haudenosaunee people, the Underground Railroad, religious freedom, and interestingly, the Oz books, Frank Baum having been the uh, son-in-law of, of uh, Matilda Jocelyn Gage. So the, but you'll have to ask Sally about that. So tonight's logistics are that we'll hear our conversation and then rather than a Q&A session, we're going to go out to the lobby. We'll have a little bit of refreshment. And then there are going to be small facilitated discussion groups. Some will be right here in the lobby, right out there in the lobby, and some will be upstairs. But you will be duly um, instructed of, of how to get where you're going. Um, please make sure to check out all the material um, from noon at the table, all the different flyers of the different activities. Uh, the next event in the series is Monday, June 14th, the ground beneath your feet is sacred. And so now let's enjoy Jeannie and Sally. Thanks. Well, we talked a little bit beforehand about who would begin, which is always the big question. And I got elected, so <laughs> I'll start. What we wanted to start out with was a little bit of sort of wrap up of our talk last time, and then we want to take a different uh, a different journey with you tonight. Is the sound okay? A little bit closer. Okay. Do you want to check yours? No. Okay. <laughs> She's good. Um, I think. Um, Last time we talked a lot about the sort of, does that work? Okay. We talked about what I see as more the, the Euro-American ways of looking at influence. And it was looking at uh, political rights and legal rights and property rights, uh, rights to uh, exist really. Because in the 19th century, uh, in the United States, under all the state laws early in the century, once women married, they ceased to exist legally. It wasn't just that they had no rights, it's that they had no existence. And everything follows from that. The two shall become one and the one is the man, canon law, the foundation for common law, and woman to be under the authority of her husband, which is throughout the Bible. And Matilda Jocelyn Gage analyzed it that really is the church at the foundation of this with the idea that woman is to be subordinate to man. So what happened when these white women who had no voice in any part of their life, whether it was spiritual or political or economic, they simply did not have a voice. What happened when they met empowered women who had a voice, who had, beyond equality, lived in a world of balance and harmony? What was the influence that it had? And one of the, one of the I think, strongest stories is Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who in 1893, after having supported treaty rights and sovereignty, written about the position of Haudenosaunee women that she describes as far superior to the position of women in her own world, uh, she is adopted into the Wolf Clan of the Mohawk Nation, and she writes to her daughter and says, my Mohawk sisters are considering me for uh, a position in the, on the Council of Voice and the Council of Matrons, which would give me a say in the choosing of the chief. The same year, she's arrested for voting in Fayetteville. 
And that contrast, you know, it's hard to imagine that there wouldn't be some sort of influence there. Uh, but I think we, we uh, talked about that at length last time. This time, what we really want to go back and forth about is the difference in the two worlds in terms of the, the reproduction of life and the reproduction of daily life. You know, what are the things that keep us existing? And if we look at, um, as Matilda Jocelyn Gage did, a world in which, as she says, never was justice more perfect, never was civilization higher. If we look at that world, you know, what, what's at the foundation of it? Is it competition? Is it, you know, getting as many toys as you can? Is it winning? Is it the sorts of things that determine status for males and females both? In, in the Euro-American world historically, or is it relationships and maintaining the existence of the planet and the existence of human beings on it? And as we were talking about it, we, you know, where do, where do we begin this story? And I suppose we begin it with birth. You're doing it right. <laughs> I guess so. We would look at uh, birth from um, different perspectives. The last time we were here was, what, two years ago, and we talked about um, the influences from the perspective of a non-Native woman. And so this time we want to talk about this perspective from somebody from within one of our communities and how we looked at things. So I hope we can, um, we can do that. Um, we wanted to talk about birth. And... Um, I just happen to have a lot of experience in that area. <laughs> being a home birth midwife for 28 years, uh, being the mother of uh, six people, and being the grandmother of many people, uh, and uh, having been present at almost all of my grandchildren's birth. And uh, of course I was there with my own, but, uh, <laughs> but with many, many other people and different experiences. And the beginning of that, before that even, I even got to that point to the experience of being with so many other people, I had a, a, a really wonderful experience and time to be able to get to that point to recapture what had been stolen from us, what had been taken away, mm -hmm. and what had been twisted from what it originally was. Mm -hmm. So I had to go out and do I guess what you would call is a lot of research, but for me it was like a lot of visiting. I went and traveled to different places and spoke to elderly women and talked about their experiences and what they thought about what was happening, what had happened to us, and and why were we like this? And we had to return to to the original way. So that was a very good experience mm -hmm. to begin with. And um, also the, the history uh, within my family was, was a very good one, having to do with, with birth. Um, my mother um, is the mother of 10, ten people, and um, she was very good in that. She gave us, every one of us, a very good birth story. It, it, it's a very precious story to me when my mother told me about the time I was born and her experience, and it was a hot summer night, and just, it was just so really good and, and so unusual in this world that many people hear the stories of birth or, or anything related to birth, and it's a, like extreme pain or some uh, medical emergency, and people outdo each other to tell the, the worst horror stories, you know. So I was really fortunate that, um, that our mother told every single one of us our birth stories about when we were born and, and, and how happy she was and told us that she had all these children intentionally because she really wanted us and she loved us. Mm -hmm. So that was a good start right there. And then also uh, relating the stories of her grandmother who raised my mother, she had been a midwife. And um, the more and more stories I heard, I came to realize it was not such a uh, 
specific thing as it would be now because it was more it was closer to um, to life you know mm -hmm. various people took part in it and it wasn't like a, 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 a one person didn't have that labor label as that person so um, I have all those wonderful uh, experience that helped me to bring to the point where I could take part in, in all these times. And in our many conversations, talking about uh, Sally's, um, Sally's research and um, the situation of, of birthing everywhere around us, that's completely out of control and unnatural, uh, twisted and stolen and it's taken away from what it really originally is, what it still is, and what it can be for everybody is a very, very special, the most sacredest of all times you could ever be when a person arrives, a brand new spirit comes onto this earth. It's like this one split second like this and you've got this a whole new person there, a whole new spirit, a heart beating and happiness. And when this person gets here, there is so much happiness and joy at that moment that you can't even describe it, right? <laughs> so many of you people know that you have these children, you know, and, 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 and you're so happy that you can't even remember what your life was like without them. You're, you're in this whole different state. So these are the things that we have to compare mm -hmm. with all the things that have happened to um, not only American women, but women all over the world mm -hmm. have been deprived of all these. Um, in my lifetime within my community, uh, it's a very joyous time when someone gives birth to a child. Uh, the whole family has a new member, the whole clan family. We have these large clan families that we all belong to and we all share in that joy and happiness. And the word spreads immediately when somebody has a new child and um, it's just happiness. It's happiness and it's all completely uh, natural. We give thanks for that person that new little person and people are anxious to come and see. And um, we have a special time when we have our ceremonies. We have ceremonies, a regular cycle of ceremonies. All year long we have ceremonies of Thanksgiving. And the very first day of every ceremony all year round, the very first day is in honor of the children. Mm -hmm. <coughs> who are the most important people of these small children. So we give thanks for them. We have a special food for them. And that's the time that they can be given their name within our clan family. That's announced and they're held up for everybody to see. And we have this wonderful day of, we have singing and dancing and a lot of people there, little babies and children of all ages. So that's the kind of uh, perspective that we would have looking at looking at birth. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's such a, it's like the world turned upside down. The, in the 19th century, and we're still the inheritors of mm -hmm. that, but in the 19th century, Matilda Jocelyn Gage marveled at women having any sort of, of um, connection to their children that she talks about an experience that happened here in this area where a husband, a father-to-be, was on his deathbed and he wrote his will. And his wife, who was pregnant, when she gave birth, the will showed that he had given that child, that unborn child, to somebody else to raise as the guardian, and the mother had no legal rights. So women from the beginning, I mean, they couldn't choose whether they wanted to birth or not. That was, that was totally under the control of men. They could not choose when they wanted to birth. They could not choose how they wanted to birth. Um, and once the children were born, that they had no, um, no legal right to the children. And that included, you know, anything, any decision making about the children was completely under the control of the, of the father. And again, it was women didn't exist legally. And so, of course, they, 
you know, their children coming through the male line, the patriarchal line, the patrilineal line, the children literally belonged to the father. And she marveled at what she saw with matrilineage, hmm. with the... And then from our perspective, then, I can't imagine what, what our women thought when they saw that happening, mm -hmm. because the people, um, the people that, that I am part of, the um, Haudenosaunee, our people are matrilineal. So our identity comes from whomever our mother is. I mean, um, there's a lot of different ways that people do things around this world, but nobody does it any different when you're getting pregnant and carrying this body, this baby within your body and feeling its growth and feeling its heartbeat and growing its spirit. And then to somebody to come along and say that baby does not carry that mother's identity, that it's the possession that of somebody else. Do you remember the first conversation we had, I forgot about this, about when I was trying to explain to you what illegitimate was? Mm. <laughs> you know, <it> was <laughs> and, well, you know, I just, I just hear this word illegitimate, it means illegal. So who on earth is here illegally, you know? <laughs> <laughs> there isn't anybody that is illegally alive. We all belong here. We all <laughs> feel together, you know? I, I, it was just so funny. She kept, we had this long conversation. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> that, that, that's a term that does not. <laughs> this is not part of us. No. And the more I tried to explain it, the more ridiculous it sounded. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But in the world that Matilda Jocelyn Gage lived in, it made perfect sense. You know, another thing. No, that it, it didn't make sense. <laughs> no, it still doesn't. But it made sense logically with well, that to system. whoever was in power at if that meant, time. Absolutely, it still doesn't yeah. make sense. No, it makes no sense. You're right. I refuse to accept that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> it did not make sense. No. It was a, it was oppression. Mm -hmm. It was extreme, extreme oppression. When we're supposed to be living in a world of equality, we all live here together. We just got through talking about that that word. Who has more right to be alive than the other? Mm -hmm. We all live here together. Every one of us are equal, and we all have equal human basic. Right, so we're all born the same way. We all should treat each other the same way. And then she comes along and tells me about all this stuff. I'm not the because <laughs> I realize that. But what you also have to realize is that I didn't know about that. I lived in this this uh, rather quiet community, just a few miles over here, Onondaga Nation. When I grew up, it was very quiet. There were not a lot of cars. I was the oldest of 10 kids. We didn't even have a car in our family. We lived fairly quiet lives. And I went to a regular school, taught the New York State curriculum through elementary school. And then later on, I went off of Onondaga Nation to another public school where they do not teach the truth in education. So I didn't know about all this stuff until Dr. Wagner came along and I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Brought you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so we all go to legitimacy. <laughs> Let's try infant damnation. <laughs> this yeah. one is really. So, so the first woman to be ordained as a minister was ordained by a minister from Syracuse, Luther Lee. Her name was Antoinette Brown. And she was ordained irregularly because women were not supposed to be in the pulpit. The Bible is clear about that. And she was, you know, there was this whole ordination that was not recognized by the, the um, congregational denomination. But she left that church over the idea of infant damnation. It was something that was really struggled with in the 19th century. And it still continues on, as you were telling me today. Um, the idea that if a child, when the child is born, if they're not instantly baptized, if they die before they're baptized, they will go to hell because they are of a woman born 
and so they're born into sin. Try that one on for size. <laughs> well, I can't accept that one either because uh, <laughs> we just went through, you know, telling about that whole thing on how um, how new people are greeted into into my family, my community, all, all of our people. Um, we have great celebration when that happens of this new spirit. And the this new person, this new person that comes here, that we get here, and if we're fortunate enough to be invited to that holy sacred ceremony when they arrive, then you have got to realize right on the spot that this is your moment too, because this is your opportunity to make a difference in this world, the life of this new person that you can influence and give them the teachings the teachings of our people, that this we're, we're so happy to see this new spirit, this, this person here, that is a gift to every one of us, a gift to every one of us on earth that has been given to us by the Creator. And you're telling me they're going to go to hell? <laughs> if something happens, that happens sometimes. That's part of natural life. Sometimes there is a new spirit that comes to us. And for some reason, they have to go back. True, there's great, there's great pain and there's great sorrow. That, that's all completely natural. It would be unnatural if you didn't feel pain and sorrow. But that's, that's a part of life. And we don't always have the answer for everything either. Mm -hmm. But, but the I don't think any little baby's going to hell. The difference between being born a spiritual being and being born in sin is a major difference between the two cultures in the 19th mm -hmm. century and the legacy we still carry. Mm -hmm. the other and thing then when the people came along, the invaders came here and saw us people who didn't have their belief in Christianity, mm -hmm. you know, and tried to tell us that we had to go and get baptized. Mm -hmm. That's still going on to this day, to this day. Mm -hmm. One of my very own grandchildren. Somebody was, uh, I don't want to say any names, was trying to tell us that this baby had to get baptized. Mm. So, yeah. I don't know if I'm going to tell the rest of the story, but this other person was the other side of the family, the, other, the baby's other side of the family that did not have the same beliefs that we had. Mm -hmm. So tried to put their beliefs onto us. So I told my daughter, this is your child. You, you do what you believe in. You do h however you feel with this, with this baby that we are so happy with. Mm -hmm. So that other person, I hope she's not here. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, she went, snuck her on and got that baby baptized. But so what? I mean, like, what? You know? <laughs> it didn't change us or anything, mm -hmm. but that, that's, a, that's an illustration to tell you that stuff's still going on. Yeah. It's still going on. You and, it's... you know, one of the things that I think I've really learned, well, in addition to everything else from you, is the, the is not was. You know, that, mm -hmm. that as we look at this influence, and that, those are the experiences that I have constantly when I'm with you. It's like, wow, Jeannie, do you realize what just happened? And for you, nothing's happened. And I've just seen a miracle. You know, and the, the <coughs> difference between our cultural experiences that continue on today, I think, is a part of our, our friendship. The, the birth thing, too, about the, um, the story of, of uh, Eve in Genesis, and Matilda Jocelyn Gage pointed to this as really the foundation of everything to do with women. There are two creation stories in the Bible. The first one in Genesis, God creates woman and man equally. But the second story, you know, he creates Eve out of Adam's rib. She's a, a, a secondary, she's to be his, his helpmate, you know, she's, she's to keep him company. And then she screws up and eats the apple. And as a result of that, two things, they're both going to be punished because he followed her leadership and took the apple as well and took a bite out of it. But she is to bring forth children in pain and sorrow, 
and she is to be under his authority, and he is to bring forth uh, food from the soil with by the sweat of his brow. So you know nobody's got a good a, a good fate awaiting them, but for women, the idea that we were to and we are too. I mean, up in the 19th century, the church was totally opposed to any anesthesia in um, childbirth and fought that tooth and nail. Um, but So but, they would suffer, huh? Yeah, so women should suffer. Engage in Woman, Church, and State, her major book written in 1893, published in 1893, talks about the, the burning of the witches by the church and then the state took it over. And one of their crimes or one of their sins that was punishable by death was that they were midwives who assisted women in childbirth, took away the pain of childbirth, therefore were doing the work of the devil and were burned at the stake for that action. But that continued on. You know, women should give birth in pain and sorrow. And the way that medicalization of birth happens today, we're still birthing in pain. Well, I'm sorrow. opposed to anesthesia too. But for the right reasons. Yeah, for the right reasons. Because like we said before, it's a, it's a, natural, uh, mm -hmm. it's a natural human thing. I mean, it happens to almost everybody. You know, we all got here the same way. Somehow. <laughs> we're all born. Yeah. But the, 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 the more natural way of it is um, coming back to, to a greater understanding in a more spiritual way. If you can find your way to, to have um, uh, more spirituality and to think about what's happening and how sacred this, this is and this mm -hmm. new person is coming and understand what's happening to you and have, um, uh, I don't know what to say, I don't want to say control, that's a bad word, but, mm -hmm. but, but have uh, the knowledge to take care of yourself properly, how to take care of each other, how everybody should, to, that's how we're supposed to be anyways, you know, even besides all that, we're supposed to be caring and compassionate, supportive of each other, take care of each other, and when you understand these kind of things and follow these ways, then uh, then something like that, it's not a scary mm -hmm. thing. It's not a scary thing to look forward. It's something to really look forward for great happiness. And, and like I said, that there's no opportunity for all of us. So when, when you remove the fear, there's mm -hmm. not all this uh, screaming and thrashing around. And when you take the, uh, the doctors, who seem to have to have control. Things are changing somewhat these days, I should tell you. But still, it went for a long period of time when, um, when uh, unnatural things were done to women during childbirth. For instance, everybody had to lay down on their back, which is the most uncomfortable way. You could do it just about anything, I guess, without allowing uh, natural movement and people to uh, uh, if you if you're in tune to to yourself and your own body, you find your own you find your own position and you move around whichever feels best. And a lot of times, for uh, for the midwife, uh, these movements of these women can signal certain things. So you get to know each other. You get to know each other so well that these body movements can help you to understand what what's happening and. Um, maybe help make things a little more comfortable. And also, you, you don't lie to them, you know. You tell the honest truth. You don't say, oh, it's not going to hurt, you know. That's a big lie. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be uh, uh, painful and screaming and fearful and completely out of control and have complete strangers standing around you at this very, uh, very uh, sacred moment when you mostly need your very own special people with you, your closest people, maybe your family, your partner, whoever you feel like you would want to have to give you strength at this time. Maybe you'll be tired and you might feel like you're, you need words of encouragement. So of course you would naturally want, uh, want um, your closest people with you, not some guy named Dr. So-and-so or, you know, some, somebody 
standing in front of you with a mask on that you've never met before. And you probably wouldn't recognize them after they took the mask off. <laughs> and, and sharing in your special time like, like that. But that's not to say that it's all entirely bad. There are some people there. I've been to a good number of um, hospital births in Syracuse, and I should say things are very much improving. I've been to some really, really happy ones where the people, um, where the people attending there did, did have share a certain amount of um, spiritual appreciation of what was going on. So. And both are happening. I mean, at the same time that Amnesty International has declared that there is an emergency in the United States in birthing, we're, I think, 41st in the world in, 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 in uh, maternal mortality. Mm -hmm. and, and the evidence that's coming in is that it's the, the extreme medicalization. Uh, cesarean sections are now normalized. Uh, we have one of the highest rates in the world True. of unnecessary, totally unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Netherlands, 5%. We're in some, in some hospitals, we're at 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, percent. And so, but you know, as you're talking, I'm, I'm transported back to the 19th century when, and actually even from the moment of contact, this new book that I'm working on that begins with birth and looking at influence talks about I'm, I'm talking about and looking at, from contact on, it's, it's missionaries, it's explorers, it's oh, yeah. anybody who's having contact saying, how is it that these women have such easy births relative to what our women have? And there's this whole question about, you know, why are they not suffering as our women are suffering? And there begins to be an exploration and a whole, a whole conversation about what are the conditions that are different. And one minister comes up with this fascinating theory that, that while God's edict that women should suffer in childbirth is universal, it only applies if you know that that's the case. So <laughs> indigenous women don't suffer because they don't know they're supposed to suffer. They didn't know about it. <laughs> that was his explanation. I think that was in the 1700s. But, but what begins to happen, Elizabeth Cady Stanton questions, why is it that only Christian women should suffer in childbirth? And she looks at, well, it's probably not the religion, but what is, com what is behind the religion that's causing this? And she begins to look at, what's the difference in what we do while we're pregnant What's the difference in the birthing procedure? What's the difference in the whole way that we maintain our bodies throughout our lives? And the question begins to emerge, not just with Stanton, but everybody. What happens to you in childbirth if you corseted your waist, you know, to the required 18 inches? That's the desired. You know, and you remove, you remove um, sometimes they would remove ribs to make it that small. But the corseting began so early that by the time a woman reached her old age, she couldn't even stand up unless she was corseted. And um, in childbirth, of course, what it meant was that all your internal organs were pressed down and women died in childbirth. They also did not exercise the food they were eating. They were in confinement from the time that they showed, their pregnancy showed, they, it, was, it was like, Oh, we know what you've been doing. You're not supposed to be outside in the public. And, um, and then afterwards, for a month, they were in confinement, it was called. So they began to look at, you know, how is it, what's different between our lives and the lives of these Native women? And they, that was, in many ways, the beginning, I think, of the, uh, the birth reform movement, when women stopped laying flat on their backs for the convenience of the doctors, and they started started, you know, taking some control over their own lives in a whole lot of different ways. Well, probably from the beginning it was diet, I would say. Major Spirituality part. and diet. Mm -hmm. Because the major thing having to, to do with a, a good health, a good strong spirit, and a good mind is the food that you eat and how you take care of yourself, how you take care of each other, how you live, live in a, within a community mm -hmm. because our people have always been agricultural and we spend much, much of our time in Thanksgiving 
thanksgiving and appreciation so that we have uh, we have just finished a, a series of days of thanksgiving within our community giving thanks for for everything around us and preparing to to plant our gardens plant our gardens with all the seeds and everything the creator gave us in this weather or who knows what this weather is to bring but we must always be prepared to take care of ourselves and when you when you appreciate the gifts of the earth and the good food and everything and you give thanks for it it's stronger and it's much mm -hmm. much spiritually stronger and your body's in better shape and, and it affects you mentally and spiritually mm -hmm. brings a lot of happiness everybody well most everybody loves to eat you know i love to eat good food i was fortunate to be raised in a family that we always had gardening we always had sort of a farm so that uh, my parents always expressed, expressed appreciation for food while we had our meals, while we did our gardening. We have certain words that we, we say every, every uh, mealtime to each other. We give thanks to each other and to the Creator for giving us this wonderful food to, to keep ourselves healthy and strong. And and take while, care of each other and take care and, of ourselves. And while you folks were eating corned beans and squash, nutritionally mm -hmm. perfect food, mm -hmm. folks in Syracuse, we were eating salted fried pork. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't eat fruit and vegetables unless we just boiled them to smithereens because it was thought that it was unhealthy to eat fresh fruits and vegetables. And the diet, you know, if, if I'm living in Syracuse and the average life expectancy is 50 years old, and I know folks at Onondaga like, Aunt, like Dinah Johns, who the Syracuse Post Standard talks about how she's walking into Syracuse almost every day when she's over 100 years old, and each year her birthday is acknowledged and, and recognized uh, in the paper. And I see somebody who's twice my life expectancy and still going, still walking into Syracuse from the nation. And I'm going to look at that and go, how are you doing this? What are you doing different than I'm doing? And food's going to be a major part of that. And this area, which is the place where all the radical reform movements sprang up, developed a food reform movement. Mm. And guess what it was? Well, why people started eating what you Indians were eating. I mean, basically it was, you know, it was really, I think, just, mm -hmm. again, the influence that we saw. This was a better way to treat yourself. And so we developed eating whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables, exactly the opposite of what we'd been eating, but exactly what you had always been eating. It goes on and on. Medicine. Or we didn't say that. <laughs> oh, we wanted to talk about um, medicine too. Um, what was your question now? What was the? Um... Well, you know, when when here's an example during the cholera epidemic in mm -hmm. the 1850s, which took a president and a whole lot of other people, the treatment that the American Medical Association, which had formed in 1847, the regular doctors used was. Um, I, I'm very sick, I have cholera, I uh, go to the doctor, the doctor immediately bleeds me. The doctor immediately takes a whole lot of blood. Then the doctor gives me massive doses of mercury, the doctor gives me purgatives, the doctor won't let me drink anything, the doctor closes the windows and, and doesn't let any fresh air in, the doctor won't let me outside, I'm kept in my sick room, and I'm dehydrated. I'm likely to die. And that's the, the sort of, will. But, but I think based on the idea that, I've really been thinking about, so where would you come up with this cockamamie notion? But it follows logically if you start with the idea that human beings are basically evil. You know, that they're basically born into sin. And so what you have to do is to get rid of the sin. Hmm? 
And that involves a form of exorcism, spiritually, but also, I think, physically. So modern medicine, Western like medicine, is based on exorcism, I think. It's like you want to get rid of this evil thing that's in, rather than building up the strength of the body, which if you believe that human beings were basically good, and that what you need to heal yourself is here, you would, you would strengthen the body, not deplete it. If right. you deplete it, mm -hmm. you kill the person. Mm -hmm. But if that's the, the well, assumption... Well, the different there, approach that, that um, our people do take, I say do, we, we do. still do, is uh, if somebody, do, somebody falls ill for some reason, um, whatever it is, uh, uh, there are plants all around us. There's plant life, you know. That's a whole, whole different spirit of, uh, of life living around us, given to us here to take care of ourselves and to take care of each other. We just need to learn what they are and how to use them. You know, we can, we go, uh, if somebody were sick, someone, another person in the family or a friend or somebody would probably know what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, uh, medicine, I guess you call it, it would, a plant would, would, would help for that situation. So the first thing that we would do is we would go out and find it, and normally the people would know where to look, what type of a area this this plant lives in with its family. Does it live on a side of a hill, in the shade, on the east side, or does it live near the swamp, or where it goes? And this person would go there, and the first thing that we do is we would appro approach this this plant family, this whole family of plants that have spirit, that have living spirit. So we go there and we approach them and we say a greeting and we give thanksgiving and we might make a little offering if we have an offering to, to the leader of this plant family. And, and you're put here to help us and we know what kind of things you can do. And will you help this person? We mention a person's name that needs, that needs assistance from this plant. So then we, we do that with the first one we approach, and then we go on and, and we harvest this. So then it's, that's it. We bring it home and prepare it and give it to the person that needs it for however long, <coughs> excuse me, they need it. And then when we're finished with it, we take that plant back out. We take it back somewhere where people don't walk, you know, some place where we put it back down and we say thank you. Thank you for coming to help this person. Mm -hmm. But it's not like a specialized thing because just about everybody, I mean not everybody, just about every household has somebody that, that knows mm -hmm. this and if not, your neighbor could do it for you. Mm -hmm. And then there are some people that are, um, that know a bit more than others. Um, I kind of do. <laughs> so a lot of people come around to me, but that's um, that's my path, and I accept it, and uh, that's how my life has been. People come um, for some type of a, a plant or a, a remedy, maybe that they don't know of, and I just happen to know about it. So I say, fine, sure. So there you are. You're welcome. It's put there for all of us. Everything is put there for all of us together. Nothing is there for anybody to own or take control of or pick all of it or patent it. It's there for all of us to share because we basically should be helping each other, taking care of each other, sharing whatever knowledge we have. But that's true in all of life anyways. Every one of us sitting here in this room, we all live here on this earth, and we all have different types of uh, talents or gifts. And we just need to share them, take care of each other. You make it all sound so simple. Well, it is, you know. <laughs> it was yeah. before it got all messed up, be, you yeah. know, and people started having to own things, you know, mm -hmm. take possession of things, you know. We're, we're in a really bad state now because of that stuff. Greed, mm -hmm. look at our, our water's in danger, in extreme, extreme 
scary danger for all of us mm -hmm. on earth right now. We better do some hard praying and thinking about that, what's happening to us. Oh, it's and, and Einstein, was it Einstein that said that, that you know, you can't solve the problems with the same mindset that caused them. And I think that if we keep trying to, to solve the problems with the same mindset that's created the greed, that's created the destruction, um, that we're just going to create more of the destruction. And, and the simplicity of living with the earth is just, you know, it's doable. I mean, you did it for all those years before the invasion and the change. Oh yeah, we did it a long time, but, but don't forget um, about that history that we were, try, they tried to interrupt us so many mm -hmm. times, you know. Our people have suffered so many damages and there is so much that we have to not only recover from, but apply ourselves to daily all of the time to maintain what we have left and to maintain the, the thoughts and the feeling that we have to, we have to share our feelings with each other and constantly tell each other. It, it can be a chore in this day and age, the way the world is around us. We have to put so much attention on, on protecting the water like I just, just uh, mentioned and, and then now we have to think about, about the future, the children. We have to teach this stuff to the children. It's very hard to teach a child uh, spiritual, spirituality and to be close and live with the earth when they got one of those uh, thumb gadgets in front of them. Yeah, it's not even funny. I could just cry about it sometimes when I see some of these children don't have the opportunity to go outside. They don't know what the first light is to come up in the morning and stand there and be, give appreciation and thanksgiving. Do they know what the fireflies look like? Are they ever gonna hear the frogs, you know, when it gets dark? Because they're all stuck with their thumbs going like this. We have a big struggle ahead of us. We have to protect this earth. We have to protect those children. We have to protect them by telling them and sharing them what we know, sharing our feelings with them. Teach them how to love the, how to love the earth, be happy where they live. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. How are we gonna, how do we teach them not to be greedy, not to repeat what's already happened to us? Mm -hmm what's happening now. And not to continue on the same path. Mm -hmm. You know, Matilda Jocelyn Gage's son wrote <coughs> about when he was a boy, they would knock passenger pigeons out of the sky. They were so thick, there were so many of them, that they would knock them out of the sky with a pole and, and make pot pies out mm. of them. Well, at and least they're eating them, yeah, that's good. Well, no, I mean to eat. Mm -hmm. But today there is not a single passenger pigeon left. They're extinct, and mm -hmm. that was within, you know, that's within a hundred years. And the and and the poetry almost, it's obscene poetry of Onondaga Lake, that the most sacred place, I mean, the place where democracy emerged, the place where where uh, the Confederacy was formed, and the vision created for all of us of what equality could look like is in our arguably the most polluted lake in the country. You know, it's sort of that's the, the creation of what this mindset has, has done. Mm -hmm. um, and the result. reversal of that yeah. is, is survival. Mm -hmm. The other perspective of that is to, is that regardless what has been done, all the damage all the greed, everything that's been taken on behalf of that lake and its surroundings and Salt City here, all this stuff, you know, everything, it's been, it's been um, so mistreated to benefit somebody, all to benefit somebody's greed and all this corporate greed dumping all this stuff, but it's still beautiful and we can still go there and we still do at times. We go there and give thanksgiving and 
and uh, give appreciation because uh, a great uh, occasion happened there for my people, for our people. A, a, a message was brought to us on the shores of that lake that brought us words of peace and taught us how to live with each other and how to think and how to feel and how to have love and compassion and share things how to organize ourselves so that we were able to have conversation and talk without um, fighting and killing each other. So that's still there. So I'm so grateful there are so many people in this area. There are so many friends that still share that feeling of uh, protection and, and wanting to help to help the earth to heal all the waterways around us and we need to protect them. Mm -hmm. So all that stuff's happening everywhere, but we need to always remind ourselves to, to, to feel the spirit there, to appreciate it and um, give acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And that living in thanksgiving, mm -hmm. instead of forgive me for I have sinned, oh. to instead <laughs> give thanksgiving to the creator. I mean, yeah. I think that that whole that spiritual mindset, the difference between the two, um, leads in very different directions. One of the things that, that I um, didn't come up tonight, but that I wanted to, we had talked about making sure there's a whole, this is, a, this is a, a tricky process in a way, because when I ask you a question, I do it with, mm, with not always being able to keep really clear boundaries about what's the difference between uh, influence and appropriation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, that fine line is a really difficult one to find, and I think one that we always are negotiating. Um, and and sometimes if I ask something that steps over the line, then it becomes really important for you to to push me back in my on my side of the the true row wampum. And and part of what I think is that it it becomes difficult because in the world of of greed in which I live, I'm as a scholar rewarded for taking your story and appropriating it and making it my own. And, um, and, and there's an idea that as long as it's floating in the world, you know, that ideas are commodities, as everything else is, including our bodies. And that I can take that commodity, like we took the land, and I can harvest the idea and, and make it mine. And that's a constant... Um, a constant battle that I have with myself uh, about my whole academic training, the whole way that I learned to, to be respected in the world, and, and to undo that and to live in, uh, in friendship and cooperation. Well, I'd say that same kind of thing when it, um, <clears throat> from my perspective, when we, 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 we've had some pretty good conversations, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I would invite some other people to take part in them. They're very uh, mind-opening. Um, coming from where I come from, this Haudenosaunee woman who has grown up um, mostly in my community. I've traveled all over the world. For many years, I've traveled, I've gone here and there, and then I always come back, like I've said many times. I truly love it here. I'm happy that this is where the Creator put me to live, and I belong here, and I'm part of this where we are, and part of my people, and uh, part of the culture, and, and whoever I am now, I am the result of my community. And all the people in the past that have been here that taught me whatever I be, have influenced me, whatever I believe or, or however I feel, and I'm grateful for that. And 
from Sally's conversation about about this line, we've reached it many times. We've been friends for, I don't know, about 60 years or so. <laughs> for a long time. And when I first met her, she wasn't, but I was at great odds with her. I did not welcome her here into the territory of my people because the history of so many things having happened to our people and crossing that line that she talks about is what I carried with me. So I guess I was a sort of a, <laughs> I was on the, I was defensive mm -hmm. and uh, um, unwelcoming uh, when I first met Sally. But we got to know each other pretty well in a short while and have conversations like this. So we can come to a point where we can understand and really appreciate how the other one thinks. And it's helped so much to, to learn the history, the parallel history together. Mm -hmm. So that, that myself being a Haudenosaunee woman have to use all of my time, all of my thinking, all of my sleeping time and my dreams to survive, for my people to survive who we are. Because we have daily, constant, constant around us influence mm -hmm. to not be who we are. To go for those little things like this. Mm -hmm. Or for somebody to come around and write a book about us. Sally's on her third book. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yeah. But we need more people to, to, to talk like this instead of just us two sitting here. We need, mm -hmm. to, we need to be friends with a lot of other people and have more conversations and understand each other so we can all survive. Because a lot of the influence that is around my people that's trying to pull us away from who we are lose our spirituality, to interrupt our connection with the earth, to disrupt our thanksgiving, our thankfulness, is affecting every one of you too, regardless of whether you have children or not. It's just all around us, and we need each other to survive and to appreciate, to be thankful. So we just, kind of need to understand that stuff together. Thank you, Jeannie. <laughs> <Are there other questions>? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, great, great, great appreciations to Sally and Jeannie for sharing some of their uh, experience, their wisdom, to give us really an intimate look at the conversations that they've had over many years. So please join me again in another round of applause for them. My name is Andy Major, and I'm part of the organizing committee, Shoney. Uh, and the speakers are Peter Jamison, who's a Seneca artist and who's worked on repatriation issues for many years, and uh, Jack Rawson, who's an archaeologist at Ithaca College and who's in the process of analyzing the results of excavation at a Cayuga village site that dates back uh, seemingly over a thousand years. Um, so that will be 7 o'clock here at Syracuse Stage, and it's in your program. A couple of other upcoming events to highlight for you that are also in the program. Uh, the Onondaga Red Hawks have a lacrosse game this coming Saturday at the arena down on Route 11A, uh, Route 11 rather, in Nedro. Uh, Sunday, June 6th, is the Community Choir's Summer Solstice Concert, Peace with the Land, Justice with Ourselves which will be at the Onondaga Nation School, a, a really wonderful event in the afternoon. And then finally, one of the 
recent past events was about hydrofracking, which uh, Jeannie didn't use that phrase, but from previous conversations, I think that's at least part of what she was talking about, about the great threats to our water here in this region. And there's a showing of a brand new documentary called Gasland that's Friday, June 11th uh, at the Palace Theater at 7 o'clock. So we encourage you to come out to all of those events if you can. Again, check out the table. And we do have copies of Sally's book, Sisters in Spirit, and she probably would be delighted to sign a copy for you if you'd like it. So again, thank you for coming, and we hope you'll join us for the discussions.